Hello there, welcome to MA Fight Club. I'm your host, Manny Galarza. Today we're breaking down Invicta FC 47 to Cody vs. Vapatella coming up on Wednesday, the 11th of May with an 8 p.m. Eastern start time. This event's being held in Kansas City, Kansas at Memorial Hall. Seven total bouts on the card where a championship is on the line in the main event. The main event will feature Emily Ducote, the current champion, and a strawweight bout against Alicia Zapatella. We'll start with the prelims, work our way all the way through the main card, give you a breakdown of each fight, a little background information on the fighters, talk about some statistics and analytics. With only seven bouts on the card, it's going to be pretty short and sweet. With that said, let's jump right into it. Here we go. The first fight in the card is going to be a strawweight battle at 115 pounds between Jennifer Dugwin Chang, who hails from Micronesia, now based out of Brooklyn, New York. Alyssa Landeska is 7-1-0 overall. She's 5-0 in her last five fights. She hails out of Illinois, 29 years old, 5'4 in height. We do not have a reach number on her. She trains out of Intercept MMA. As for Jennifer Chang, she's 1-1 as a pro, 36 years old, 5'4 in height with a 64-inch reach. She's out of Mantra MMA, and she trains out of Renzo Gracie Academy. Both ladies are the same height at 5'4". Reach-wise, we don't have a number here on Tapology for Alyssa, but when you look at film of her, her arms are pretty long, her legs are pretty long. She'll probably have a slight reach advantage over Jennifer Chang. Looking at the votes on Tapology, Lindisco's getting 79% of the votes, 21% of the votes coming in for Chang. A little surprise, Chang is the former pro boxer, former Olympian. She seems to have a pretty good fan following, but according to the public, Lindisco is the favorite. We don't have the money lines yet in this fight. We're going to project to you what we think the money lines will be when they drop, but they're not available just yet. Let's look at the background of Jennifer Chang. She was born and raised in the United States, but her ancestors is from Micronesia. She made the 2016 Olympics on behalf of her country, and she was the flag bearer for Micronesia in that Olympics. Unfortunately, she was eliminated in the first round. She worked a job on Wall Street before pursuing a career in MMA. We provided a link down below. You can see an interview of her where she talks about the transition from going behind the desk to being in the octagon. It's pretty cool. She went 3-1 as an amateur. She went pro 2018 at Bellator 208, and she won via round one TKO over Jessica Ruiz. Her prior opponents, the most notable one, would be Helen Peralta. 2020 decision lost. That was her last fight about two years ago. Peralta's a pretty good fighter. For example, but Peralta has a win over Cheyenne Lismus, who's currently in the UFC, and she's also fought Kay Hansen. This fight by far was her hardest competition to date. Peralta overpowered her in the clinch. She was a much stronger fighter. I'm not sure that Jennifer Chang is not good in the clinch, but in that matchup, you can see there was a power disadvantage for her. And when she got taken down by Helen Peralta, her stand-up game was not very good. It appeared she was accepting a position, wrapping her legs around the waist, and not really trying to get back up. Mind you, Peralta's a good fighter, and by far the biggest test she's had so far. A few notable positives on Jennifer Chang. Her boxing fundamentals are very good. You can see she's a former boxer. Her guard's up nice and high, snappy jab. She displayed good takedown defense at times against some of her opponents. She's been very durable so far as an amateur and a pro. She's not been finished. Now my concern for Chang. Now some of my criticism for Jennifer Chang. She lacks finishing power. Other than the KO she had over Jessica Ruiz, she's got a decision in all of her amateur and pro fights. And keep in mind, Jessica Ruiz has been knocked out before and wasn't the biggest test for her. Her overall strength of schedule has been pretty weak. If you remove Helen Peralta from the equation, the combined record of her opponents is 4-9. Two of those opponents are 0-3, and one of them is 1-0 with the only win being over Jennifer Chang. She's also coming off of a two-year layoff, and she also had a two-year layoff between her last two fights. So that's like two fights in four years. Not very active. She stands in a very traditional boxing stance, a high guard, and she stands very tall. The problem with that is she leaves her hips wide open for takedowns. Against Peralta, she was exposed. She couldn't stop the grappling. She couldn't break the clinches. Against a good wrestler, against a good grappler, that could be an issue. In this matchup against Alyssa Landuska, Landuska has shown the ability to grapple before. So Jennifer Chang is not paying attention to her hips and standing very very high that could be a problem for her in this matchup. Now looking at the profile for Alyssa Landuska, the American fought Julia Russell last year, won the fight by decision. Russell is 8-6 overall, not the best competition, about a 500 level fighter in lower promotion. She came out blazing in the first round, put pressure on Russell, backed her up, landed a lot of volume, clearly won round one. She came out in round two and three, kept the same thing going, backing up Russell, keeping the pressure going, landing the better strikes. At times, her head movement wasn't the best, but between rounds two and three, she made some adjustments and actually came out, had better head movement. Her guard was a bit tighter. It was an easy matchup for her. Julia Russell did not give her much of a test. Her prior fight, Kelsey Hadell, 2020 decision win. Kelsey is seven and six overall, another 500 level type of fighter. Alyssa loses round one of this fight. In round one, Kelsey comes out aggressive, takes her down. She's landing ground and pound, almost appeared like it was on the way to a stoppage. But what you see Alyssa Leduska do in this fight, she makes adjustments. She looks to grapple. She keeps the fight nice and close. She recovers. She wasn't really hurt, but she recovers from the position. Kelsey was on top of her, landing good strikes. Round two, she comes out. She takes down Kelsey Hadell right away. Owns top position, keeps her down for the entire round. Round three, the same exact thing. Makes the adjustments, comes out, wins round two and three after dropping round one. Showed very good fighter IQ. She also used her cardio as a weapon because in that fight, Kelsey Hadell was definitely gassing out towards the end of round two and three. Yet Alyssa Landuska looked calm, composed with a stronger fighter. Overall, good win. Keep in mind, Kelsey is seven and six overall. And again, her prior opponent, eight and six. About 500 level fighters in lower level promotions. Some things about Alyssa I do like a lot. She's got forward pressure. She comes forward in her fights. Even in the fight against Kelsey Hadell, where she lost round one of that fight, she was coming forward. She was trying to 
push the pace. Very high volume striker. Limited power, but lots of volume. Mixes up leg kicks in combination with her punches and a women's bout that could be all the difference in the world in the scorecards. She's been able to weaponize her cardio. She has good forward pressure late in fights. She's got good strength in the clinch. And when her opponents start to gas, she sees the blood in the water and she really goes for it. Over the eight total fights she's had, she's not been knocked out, not been submitted, so she's been very durable. My concerns for Alyssa Landuska. Her chin's a little bit high for my liking. I'd like to see her get her chin down a little bit, especially when she's trading against someone like Jennifer Chang, who has a boxing background. That could be the recipe for disaster. And this would mark the pro debut for Alyssa Landuska. She's fought more total MMA fights than Jennifer Chang, but those have been all amateur fights. The bright lights will be on her. It'll be her first pro bout. It'll be her toughest competition. How does she respond to that? It'll also be longer rounds. In her prior fights as an amateur, she was doing like five-minute first rounds and three-minute second rounds, three-minute third rounds. This will be three five-minute rounds. Does her cardio check out in this fight? Is she able to keep her cardio as a weapon in round two and three to longer fight? Does she gash herself out? Does she get too excited? A lot of question marks here for the first-time pro fighter. The biggest question mark for me in this fight is who's going to be more powerful in the clinch. Jennifer Chang, she got overpowered by Helen Peralta. Alyssa Landuska, at times in some of her fights, she wasn't the most powerful in the clinch either, and her frame is more of a longer, thinner frame. Chang looks to be a little bit thicker. The clinch scenarios could be the difference maker in this fight, and I'm not sure who has an advantage in that department. I would like to think that Jennifer Chang, the Olympian, looks a little bit stronger, should have the power advantage in the clinch, but that's not really her game, right? She's a boxer. She wants to keep it at a distance. For those watching on YouTube, in our description, you're going to see four links there for the prior fights of these two fighters. My final thoughts on this fight. Experience-wise, a bit of a toss-up. You see Alyssa has more total mixed martial arts fights, but she has no pro fights. Jennifer Chang's also a former Olympian. I guess you can argue Jennifer Chang has fought on a bigger stage. She's fought two pro fights compared to none for Alyssa. So maybe a slight experience advantage for Jennifer Chang. As for strength of schedule, Jennifer Chang gets the nod there just because she fought Helen Peralta. Otherwise, both of them have fought more or less cans, 500 level fighters. For finishing ability, I do give a small edge to Alyssa Landuska. For Jennifer Chang, she had the one knockout over Ruiz. Again, not a very good test, not a good example of having finishing power. But with Alyssa Landuska, she's had two armbar finishes. She seems to be the better grappler overall. If the fight gets to the ground, she'll have an ability to finish on the ground. Whereas Jennifer Chang, it's on the feet exclusively via punching, TKO power. That's her path to getting a finish. In a fight here between two women lower weight class i just don't see a finish happening in this fight unless it's going to be a submission by Alyssa landuska neither fighter's been finished before so they both have good durability i think Alyssa has the edge in grappling technique but i feel as if jennifer chang has the power advantage the strength advantage that should be the indicator of how the fight goes and could be the deciding factor in a fight where on the feet you're gonna have the high volume of Alyssa, who's gonna get counterpunched you're gonna have jennifer chang who's got good boxing technique maybe landing the more crisper heavier shots but Alyssa landing more shots it's gonna be hard to judge so maybe the ground game or clinch time ends up being the defining factor. The money line probably opens up with this being around a pick em, like minus 125 to minus 150 for Jennifer Chang and plus 110 for Lindesca. I do think Jennifer Chang, having the Olympic level experience, having a bit of a name, she's going to have a slight edge here in the money line, but it's a pick em. It can go either way. From a betting perspective, if your book offers the fight going to decision, that's probably the best spot to get into. There's reasons to like or dislike both fighters. I'm going to slightly edge the American Alyssa Lindesca to win the fight by decision. Next up, we have a strawweight battle at 115 pounds between two American fighters, Fatima Klein, who goes by the Archangel, and Sydney Trio, who goes by Sid Vicious. Trio is 2-0 overall. She's from Anaheim, California, 22 years old, 5'3 in height with a 64-inch reach. She's out of Rounders MMA. As for Fatima Klein, she's 1-0 overall. She's based out of New York, 21 years old, 5'6 in height with a 67.5-inch reach. So a slight reach and height advantage there for Klein. She trains out of Black Hole Jiu-Jitsu. As for the public votes on topology, Klein is the favorite, getting 66% and Trio 34%. This is a real tough fight. Very, very close. When the line comes out, it's probably going to be a pick'em. I'm going to ever so slightly go on the side of Trio. I think she's got better boxing, and on the ground, I believe they're about similar. Of course, Fatima Klein is the better overall grappler, done a lot of tournaments, good submissions. But on the ground, I think that Trio would do enough to neutralize that, and on the feet, I believe Trio's a much better boxer. Looking at the fighter profile for Fatima Klein, she started mixed martial arts at 10 years old for the purposes of self-defense. Her mom enrolled her into a basic Muay Thai class to help her stave off the bullies. She's fought in Muay Thai, boxing, MMA, and grappling. She qualified for the Junior Olympics in her teenage years. She coaches BJJ when she's not training and she has excellent grappling experience. 19 total grappling matches with a 13 and 6 overall record. Her most notable opponents, she fought Krista Hannaford, 2019 decision win. This was her only amateur mixed martial arts fight. Krista is 2 and 3 overall as an amateur, so not the best competition, and she got pieced up in that fight on the feet. On the ground, she controlled things. Against the fence, good grappling control, good position control, body locks, brought her opponent to the ground. But in the brief moments when the fight was on the feet, Krista Hannaford was piecing her up. Another prior fight, Ariana Melendez, 2021 round one submission win. That was on Invicta. That was her first pro MMA fight. Melendez is 2-1 and one overall, a decent opponent, but again, not a world beater by any means. In the first round of that fight, she takes her opponent down to the ground immediately, and she stays in top position. She lands ground and pound strikes, 
Eventually, Melendez makes a mistake while she's trying to move, and Fatima gets a rear naked choke for the win in round one. Some things I like about Fatima Klein, tremendous grappling and submission skills, not only to get a finish or to beat her opponent, but also to survive. If she gets into trouble on her feet with striking, she can use the grappling to mix things up and close the distance. I like the forward pressure. She tries to get the fight to the ground immediately. She knows what she's good at, and she tries to stick to that. She doesn't play any games on her feet for a round or two. Her grappling skills are pretty good, but her wrestling skills aren't that bad either. Her wrestling skills are good. Her judo throws are good. All different ways for her to get the fight to where she wants it. And of course, like a typical grappler, she backs up her opponent against the cage. It'll be tough here against Trio, who's got good footwork and also likes to stand and bang, but I expect Klein to close the distance, back Trio against the cage, and look to do grappling and then drag it to the ground. And her cardio checks out. So the forward pressure you see in round one and round two of her prior fights, that stays all the way through round three. She's going to need that against Trio, who also has a good gas tank, likes to move around, good footwork, but for Klein, she'll be looking to get the clinch going and drag the fight to the ground. That's her only path to victory in this matchup. Now, my concerns for Klein. Her striking is raw. We just talked about it against Hannaford. She looked completely out of her element. Her hands were just up, sort of blocking. No striking power in her hands. Very limited combinations. No kicking game. So on the feet, she has a hard time. It also makes her very one-dimensional. On the ground, she's at home. She's comfortable. Again, 19 total grappling bouts. She's trying to grapple. On the feet, not in her element. This fight will be on the feet at times. Trio has such a big advantage there. And on the ground, I think Trio does just enough to neutralize some of the things that Klein is very good at. As for Sydney Trio, her base in mixed martial arts is Muay Thai. She's been training mixed martial arts for about five years. She went 3-1 as an amateur. Both of her first pro wins have been in LFA, which is a very good promotion. Her two wins in the LFA were over Alandria Brown and Melissa Parker. Over Brown, 2021 decision win. That was her last fight. Brown is 2-1 overall. Decent prospect. Again, nothing too special. Now, Melissa Parker, 2020 split decision win. That was her pro debut in LFA. She was 21 years old at the time, and Parker was 34. She was 13 years the junior. Parker currently has a 3-1 record, and she's fighting in Fury FC. The fight starts off with Parker doing her thing. She's landing some hard strikes, backing up Trio. It looked kind of rough in the beginning, but Trio does a great job. 21 years old, calms down, does get overwhelmed, lets Parker sort of blow her wide, then gets the pace back, starts controlling position, starts landing the better strikes, and then gets a takedown in round one at some point. It's going to be a factor in this fight because I believe her explosiveness on takedowns is a little bit better than Klein. I can see Trio getting some takedowns and get some top control in this fight. But the most important thing I took for the Melissa Parker fight is in the beginning of the first round, she gets cracked. She has a good chin. She's under attack. She's losing that first 30 seconds to one minute of the first round. She calms down like a veteran, only 21 years old. Her pro debut gets the fight back under control, gets some clinch time, gets some ground control time, gets some top position time, and takes the fight over and wins in round two and three to secure a win in her pro debut. A few things I like about Trio. She has some finishing ability. She's gotten four finishes in her six total mixed martial arts fights. She's got two quality wins in the LFA to start her career 2-0. This matchup is a classic case of a striker in Trio versus submission grappler type in Klein. I believe though the trio has enough on the ground to neutralize Klein on the ground and then when it comes to the striking there's gonna be a big advantage there for trio who's very sharp throws in combination and can take a punch trio also has a very good lower leg kick at times she doesn't use it enough against Parker she starts mixing in the lower leg kicks does a great job changes things up forces her opponent to think of the leg kicks my two criticism for trio when she's trading with her opponent her chin is wide open it's a classic case of just throwing and no regard for your face. In this matchup, that should not be an issue. Klein is not much of a striker. She's got to tighten up her hand placement more when she's trading, get the hands back up, make sure she's protecting her face. And when she's under pressure, like for example, the first part of the fight against Parker, her punches are not straight. She's kind of looking down, looping, just hoping they land. Won't be a factor in this matchup. It just shows that she needs some improvement in her striking. When she's on point and her head movement is going well and she's focused, her striking looks good. But under pressure, everything changes, of course. And under pressure, she kind of reverts back to her instincts, which is big looping shots, her head down. My final thoughts on this fight. Experience-wise, you got 1-0 versus 2-0. You got Fatima Klein with a ton of grappling experience. You got Sydney Trio with a ton of Muay Thai experience. About the same experience, basically. For strength of schedule, I do give the edge to Sydney Trio. She's 2-0 as a pro in the LFA. LFA is a good promotion. So even though there's only one more pro fight over Fatima Klein, I think she's fought the better opponents, and she's done a pretty good job, obviously 2-0. For finishing ability, Klein has a submission ability, but Trio has submissions and the hands. If you had to really pick it apart, you know, splitting hairs, probably Trio has a slight finishing advantage. If anyone gets a finish here, I believe it's Sydney Trio, either by an arm bar or by some kind of TKO. They've both shown very good chins. Granted, they've only fought a few fights in total, but they haven't been finished. And lastly, grappling. Who's the better grappler? I think Fatima Klein clearly has the grappling advantage, you know, 19 total grappling tournaments. Sydney Trio is serviceable, though. I think she's more explosive. I think she's stronger than Klein. I think she'll get some cleaner takedowns at times. But on the ground, who's the better technician? I think that's Fatima Klein. Could she submit Trio? I think she could. She's got the skills. That's what she hangs her hat on. But I think Sydney Trio is able to neutralize a lot of what happens on the ground, force the fight to be on the feet. And on the feet, it's going to be a glaring disadvantage for Klein.
line. I like Sydney Trio to win the fight. The money line for this fight's not out yet, but when it does come out, I imagine it being like minus 110, minus 110 both sides, more or less a pick up down the middle. Very evenly matched fighters. You got the striking of Trio versus the submission ability of Climb. Should be a very good fight. Probably goes a distance. That's the breakdown, guys. We're on Sydney Trio to win the fight ever so slightly. I wouldn't put a lot of money behind this fight. Bet with caution. There's a lot of close fights in this card, and this one might be the closest of them all. Good luck if you're betting on this fight. Next up, we have a bantamweight bout at 135 pounds between Serena De Jesus, who goes by the Southpaw Outlaw, and Brittany Cloudy, who goes by the Quiet Storm. Cloudy's 4-3 and three overall, 3-2 three in her last five fights. She hails from California, 32 years old, 5'9 and high with a 70 and a half inch reach. She trains out of Team Oyama. As for the Southpaw Outlaw, 4-2 and two overall, 3-2 in her last five fights. She's based out of Las Vegas, Nevada, 30 years old, 5'8 and high with a 69 and a half inch reach. She trains out of Extreme Couture and also Syndicate MMA. Height and reach-wise, these guys are about the same. Age-wise, only a two-year difference. And look at the numbers on Tapology. It appears the public's on the side of De Jesus, getting 81% of the votes, only 19% coming in for Cloudy. I strongly disagree. I like Cloudy to win the fight. I'll try to break it down for you and explain to you why. Taking a look at the profile for Serena De Jesus. She hails from Philadelphia originally. She was doing mixed martial arts in Philly, but didn't like the scene. Grabs two duffel bags, moves halfway across the country to Las Vegas with only the money in her pocket and two duffel bags. That was it. She ends up linking up with Roxanne Mataferi. If you know anything about Roxanne Mataferi, the legendary UFC future Hall of Famer, she's a kind soul. She takes this young lady under her wing. They end up becoming roommates and basically Roxanne Mataferi shows her the ropes. And then Serena begins training at Syndicate MMA where of course Roxanne Mataferi was based out of before she retired. She fights out of a southpaw stance. She's the first female MMA pro fighter to be diagnosed with autism. Specifically, she's been diagnosed with Asperger syndrome, which is a subcategory of autism on the autism spectrum. She is a consumer of CBD oil to manage her symptoms. She went four and two as an amateur. She's on a three fight winning streak. and She is two and two in Invicta. She also fought in Valor FC, Fusion Fight League and Titan FC. Her most notable opponents, Lauren Mueller, 2021 split decision win. That was her last fight. Mueller is a former UFC fighter. She went two and three the UFC. She has a five and four overall record, but she's currently on a four fight losing streak. Decent in competition, but obviously Mueller's having a rough go of it right now. She fought Taylor Guardado in 2020. That was a split decision loss. That was an Invicta. It's an exhibition bout. Guardado's 3-2 and two overall, currently in the PFL. She fought last year against Kayla Harrison in her last fight. That might be why you know the name Taylor Guardado. And one more fight, Arlene Colbreth. 2017 decision win. That was her last amateur mixed martial arts fight. Colbreth is 4-5 and five overall. She has a very nice lead jab. She commands the center of the cage and likes to lead the pace. She throws a really nice standing left hook, which goes around the guard of her opponent. So if you imagine the opponent's got their hands here, and that hook comes around the side to like the temple. Doesn't hit with a lot of power, but she does throw it often as she seems to land that punch with high accuracy. And she's got killer instinct. When she has her opponent hurt, she picks up the pace, picks up the volume, backs them up, and starts unloading. My concerns for De Jesus, she's faced extremely low-level competition. For example, she's on a three-fight winning streak. The three opponents she beat have a combined record of 15 and 18. The combined record of all the opponents that she's beaten her career is 20 and 22. She has a plotting technique where she moves forward. She's not very quick. She doesn't have that quick twitch muscle, but at times she gets very slow to the point where you can clearly see what she's gonna do. You can see the punches coming. And as round two and round three set in, she gets even slower. She moves in a very laboring manner, not because she's tired, it's just sort of her technique. She lacks speed. And lastly, she throws a lot of pitter padding punches, a lot of touching punches, but nothing with power. And that's reflective in her finish rate. All seven of her pro fights have gone a decision. So clearly she lacks finishing ability. As for Brittany Cloudy, grew up a multi-sport athlete herself. She played basketball through high school. She ran track at St. Louis University, where she holds five school records and was inducted into the School Athletic Hall of Fame. She began combat sports about two years after she graduated from college. She's got a 5-1 amateur record, 2016 Golden Gloves champion. She went pro last year, 0-1 in the LFA, has fought in LFA, aka peak fighting, and now an Invicta. Her most notable opponent, she fought Sarah Kleska, 2021 decision win. Kleska is 3-3 overall and 1-2 in Invicta. She fought earlier this year in January and has a win over Annette Nichols by decision. Annette was 2-0 no coming into that fight. Cloudy was a sizable underdog, like plus 200-ish, almost a 2-1 to one underdog. Came in there and whooped Nichols' ass. Beat her up pretty badly, cut her up, and the fight was stopped because of a cut. But if it wasn't stopped because of the cut, she was on her way to getting a finish anyway. Two more names you might recognize. Erin Blanchfield. They fought in 2018. She lost by split decision. Now, mind you, Erin Blanchfield's 2-0 in the UFC. That loss is definitely aging very well. And then she fought Helen Peralta as an amateur. 2016 round 2 TKO loss. Helen Peralta's pretty good. She's serviceable. Also an Invicta. So pretty good names there in her tapology. Some things to like about Brittany Cloudy. She's a very active fighter. She fought twice last year. She's already fought once this year. This will be a second fight coming up. She fought twice in 2020 and three times in 2019. She works behind a very good long jab. 
She's usually the taller fighter. In this matchup, she'll have a slight reach advantage and a slight height advantage, but that length, she puts it to work. When she goes out with that jab, she really turns her body, and that lead jab has a lot of distance. Her striking is very technical. You could tell the former 2016 Golden Gloves champion. Her punches come right down the pipe. No looping stuff. No wild, crazy off-balance stuff. It's right down the pipe, nice and straight. Based upon watching the film on them, she should have a significant speed advantage in this fight, which means the counters will be available, which means she should have the higher output and the higher volume in this matchup. She does use some lower leg kicks. She's got, again, very long legs. She can reach her opponent. She doesn't do it very much. I'd like to see her use it more, but it's part of her arsenal. And though she's not known as a grappler, her takedown defense is pretty damn good. When she's been pinned up against defense, she reverses position, disengages, and forces the fight to be out in the open. It shouldn't be that much of an issue in this fight. Both of them like to work out in the open. Now, if we get to a clinch situation, Brittany Cloudy has nasty knees in the clinch. Not just a Muay Thai clinch, but just any kind of a clinch where she has an opportunity to land inside knees to the stomach, to the chest, or to the head of her opponent. That's partially how she busted up Nichols when they fought. Now, my concerns for Brittany Cloudy. Her grappling isn't her strong suit. If she goes up against a very good grappler, she's going to have a hard time. And this matchup shouldn't be an issue. She's fought decent competition, maybe a bump up over Serena to Jesus, but overall, still very low level competition. She has not beat anyone notable. At times, her volume goes down because she's looking for the perfect punch. It's more of a mentality thing, not a fatigue thing, just looking for the perfect punch. I'd rather her just work on higher volume, higher output. In this matchup, she's going to need it because Serena likes to also throw a lot of volume too. And in a women's fight, the high volume fighter pretty much wins on the scorecards. And lastly, I like to see her tuck her chin a little bit. When she gets into these wild exchanges with her opponent, her chin is wide open. She's not guarding her face. It's a common flaw of a lot of inexperienced athletes, especially females who are not worried about getting knocked out as much. So I like to see her put her chin down a little bit, get her hands back up to her face quicker, especially during heated exchanges. My final thoughts on these two fighters, I think Brittany Cloudy has the experience and strength of schedule advantage. We mentioned some of the names of who she's fought. In the case of Serena DeJesus, she's in a good camp, Cynic MMA. She's got good role models like Roxanne Mataferi around her, good coaching, but she really has not fought anyone yet. As for finishing ability, neither one of them is an amazing finisher. In the case of Serena, she went seven straight decisions. Brittany Cloudy has two finishes, but they're arm bar finishes. They're against lower level competition. I think Brittany Cloudy punches a little harder in this matchup, probably has the, the better cleaner looking shots. Could she knock out Serena? Probably not. Could she get an arm bar here, submission? Again, most of the fight will be on the feet. So I don't think either one of these fighters gets a submission finish or knockout finish, but if I had to give an edge to someone in finishing ability, it would be towards Brittany Cloudy. As for durability, it's up in the air. They haven't really fought high level people recently. We haven't seen them go through any wars or have to bleed or go through a tough three or four or five round fight. It's an unknown factor in this matchup. And lastly, who's the better grappler? I mentioned before, Brittany Cloudy's got good grappling defense. I haven't seen her on the offensive or using submission skills, though she does have two submission wins. And as for Serena De Jesus, it's all on the feet all the time. I don't think grappling is going to play a part in this fight, but in the case there is some grappling, in the case there's some grappling, it's probably Brittany Cloudy initiating some grappling against the fence to get into that clinch, use the tie clinch, work the knees, but I do not see the fight going to the ground. If the fight's on the ground, it's probably because of a slip or someone maybe gets knocked down, the other person jumps on top of them. But both fighters here have made it clear based upon their past fights, their technique of preference is to work on the feet. At the time of the recording of this video, the money line is still not available, but I'm going to project the money line opens up around minus 210 for Brittany Cloud. The people's champion, according to Tapology, is Serena De Jesus. I disagree. I think Brittany Cloudy is the better over fighter. It shows up on film. The stats also support that. If the price tag's around minus 210 or maybe even a pick them, there's some good value here. I like Brittany Cloudy. I'll be taking a full unit on her straight up. And dare I say, maybe I parlay her with something. That's the breakdown, guys. Thanks for joining us. If you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe and leave some comments. Let me know what you guys think. Do you like Cloudy? Do you like the Jesus? And why? All right, guys, we're on to the next video. Next fight in the card is going to be a flyweight bout at 125 pounds between two Brazilian fighters, Janissa Morandin and Liana Perezin. Liana is 7-4 overall, 2-3 in her last five fights. She hails from Cutaliba, Parana, Brazil, 29 years old, 5'5 five five in height with a 64-inch reach. She trains out of Yamauchi team. As Morandin, who goes by the Evil Princess, she's 10-4 overall, 1-4 in her last five fights. She hails from Santa Catarina, Brazil, 27 years old, 5' foot in height, so 5 inches shorter, and a 61-inch reach, about a 3-inch disadvantage for her. As for the public numbers coming in on Tapology, to my surprise, 69% are coming in for Janissa Morandin and only 31% coming in for Liana Perez. In. I think that this fight's a toss-up. <laughs> It's really hard to get a read here. I'm going to say this with all due respect, like from the movie Talladega Nights when Ricky Bobby's like, with all due respect, and I mean with all due respect, they're both not very good. It's like, who's going to win this fight or who's going to lose the fight? Or maybe they both lose the fight or maybe it goes to a draw. They've not been active. They're both coming off about two-year layoffs. They've lost against decent opponents. They've lost against bad opponents. They've gotten crushed against their better opponents. They both fought UFC caliber fighters and have come up way short in those fights. This is a fight where I want to stay away from from a betting perspective. I'm going to give you the breakdown and tell you why I like Liana Parizan to win the fight, but man, this one's a toss-up and truly gambling at this point because there's no reason to really back
back either fighter here unless you know something from the inside the camp you have close knowledge of the situation otherwise what i'm looking at here is two fighters that are very low level someone has to lose right and someone has to win and if you have an idea of which way to go on this please leave a comment down below because for me this is a complete toss-up looking at the fighter profile for Miranda, she was born in brazil she began her career in 2013 she started off 9-0 in the brazilian regional scene she's 1-4 in invicta she had a 1-0 amateur record some of her prior opponents, she fought Montserrat Ruiz in 2020, two years ago, lost a fight round one submission. That was an Invicta 41. Ruiz is 10-2 and two overall, currently 1-1 one in one the UFC, so not the worst loss, but she did get dominated, got thrown to the ground by a hip toss, and if you know Ruiz, she likes that headlock. She locks up Miranda on the ground with a headlock, then controls one arm, starts beating her in the head, and then gets a submission, but it was a submission because she was like laying on her neck, no real choke, just laying on her, and Janisa just taps out. A horrible loss from top to bottom. One, it was early in the fight. Two, a submission I've never even seen before. It was basically just laying on her neck or laying on her throat. I'm not saying she wasn't getting choked, but showed just a lack of ability to get up, no grappling skills, just looked like an amateur in there. A few more fights for her. She fought Emily Cody, 2019 round one TKO loss. Of course, Dakota is on this current fight card. She's fighting for the championship in the main event. She also fought Jandroba, 2018 round two submission loss. Now, Jandroba is in the UFC as well. Pretty good overall fighter. Jandroba dominated her on the ground in round one. And round two comes out, takes her to the ground again with ease and gets an easy triangle submission. And very similar to the Ruiz fight, Miranda just looks completely out of her element on the ground. Cannot fight off any submissions. She's from Brazil. Should have a basic BJJ understanding. Does not do well with submission defense. And one more fight, Lavana Souza, 2017 decision loss. Quality loss in the fact that she went to decision against Lavana Souza. Souza is 14 and 4 overall and also currently in the UFC. So if there's one thing I can give to Miranda, she's fought some pretty good level competition, UFC caliber fighters. At the same time, she's also getting finished by those fighters. So it's kind of like this half glass full, half glass empty, depending on how you look at it. Now my concern is Miranda. She's been finished by all the higher level fighters she's fought against. So her durability is in question. This is a small weight class. It's a women's weight class and she's getting finished. Matter of fact, she's been finished in her last three straight fights. She hasn't had her hand raised in five years, a half a decade. That's a long time without winning a fight. She's also coming off of a two-year layoff. That's never a good sign in your late 20s. You should be more active at this point in your career. And she has a significant height and reach disadvantage in this fight. She usually is the smaller fighter. In this fight, she'll have a three-inch reach disadvantage and a five-inch height disadvantage. Now, as for Liana Perosin, she's also from Brazil. No amateur record. She went pro in 2013. She has nine years of pro experience, has fought in Immortal FC, XFC, and also in Invicta. Her most notable opponents, again, some names you'll recognize. She fought Kay Hansen two years ago, lost her by decision in Invicta. That loss wasn't so bad back then. It's not aging that well now, though, because Hanson is 7-6 and six overall and just got cut by the UFC. She also fought Kanako Murata in 2019, round one submission loss by rear naked choke. Murata is 12-2 and two overall and currently 1-1 one one in the UFC. So again, you like the fact that she's fighting fighters who are UFC caliber, but you don't like the fact that she's losing to them. She also lost to Del Bonnie in 2018 via decision. And one more fight, Kimberly Novaez, 2018 decision win. That was her last victory. Novaez is 9-6 and six overall. She's on a five-fight losing streak, and Novaez has not won a fight in six years. That's the last person that Liana Perazin has beat. The one thing there is to like about both these fighters is the same quality. They've both fought against high-level fighters that are now currently in the UFC. On the flip side is they've come up short in those fights. Which one is better than the other? I'm not really sure. It's like picking straws. Now, some of my concerns for Liana, she's coming off of a two-year layoff. She's on a two-fight losing streak. She hasn't had her hand raised in four years. And the biggest issue is the size disadvantage. She is so much smaller than most of her opponents, and it shows right away on film. You see it. In this matchup, she's going to be five inches shorter. She's going to be much smaller. It's going to be harder for her to close distance, harder for her to reach her opponent. And I think overall, just harder for her to win a fight when she's so much smaller than her opponent. My final thoughts on these two fighters, experience-wise and strength of schedule, very comparable, just about the same. For finishing ability, neither one is showing good finishing ability. They're getting finished, but they're not showing a lot of finishes on their resume. For durability, yeah, I question both of their durability. I think in this fight, it's a good matchup. Neither one probably finishes each other in this matchup, but whenever they fight UFC caliber fighters, they tend to get finished specifically by submission. And who's the better grappler? Neither one of these guys are good grapplers. They get submitted pretty frequently against high-level opponents. They're both from Brazil. They should have a BJJ base, but you don't see it in the fights. If they get taken down, they can't get back up. They tend to get submitted. This fight is a complete toss-up. I'd love to know what the public thinks more about this fight. Maybe you have some insider knowledge. Maybe you have an inside track on something that we don't know. I would not bet this fight. There's so many unknowns. If I had to pick a side, I think Liana Perazin is the slightly better fighter, more so just because she's got the height and reach advantage, and there's really no other advantages here that I could find. So I'm on Liana Perazin to win the fight by an ugly decision. Heck, maybe this fight goes to a draw. This fight right here just offers a ton of variables that we can't answer, and ultimately, both of them are coming off of these two-year layoffs. Losing streaks have not looked good. It's a good matchup. Someone has to win the fight. So that's the breakdown, guys. Good luck with this fight if you're betting on it. And let me know what you think. Who you like in this fight? Mm, last night was so amazing. Hell yeah, it was. <laughs>
What's up, Bruce? You going for round number two? You know it. Brought to you by Blue Chew. Do it and do it! Next up, we have an atom weight battle between two American fighters, Lindsay Van Zant and Julian DeCourcy. DeCourcy's 4 and 3 overall, 2 and 3 in her last five fights. She hails from Queens, New York. 37 years old, 5'2 in height with a 63 inch reach. She trains at Long Island MMA and she goes by Lionheart. As for Lindsay Van Zandt, who goes by Damsel, she's 7 and 5 overall, 1 and 4 in her last five fights. She hails from Scottsdale, Arizona, 28 years old, 5'2 in height with a 64 inch reach. She trains out of Precision MMA. So physically, they're very similar, 5'2 in height for both sides and about 64 to 63 inch reach. Looking at the public votes on Tapology, it appears that Van Zandt is the favorite, getting 70% of the votes, 30% coming in for DeCourcy. It's a very tough fight to pick. I'm also going to side with Van Zant. I'm with the side of the public vote. Her athleticism will be the difference maker in this fight. It's going to be close. They've fought before. They've also fought a lot of similar opponents. But the bottom line is there's a lot of similarities with these two fighters and they're very well matched. It's a good matchup for Invicta. Looking at the pro fought for Lindsay Van Zant. She was 3-3 three and three as an amateur. She went 1-3 in her last four amateur bouts. She fought Jillian Robertson as an amateur. Lost that fight by decision. Of course, Jillian Robertson is in the UFC. This will be a rematch for Lindsay Van Zandt. She fought Jillian DeCourcy back in their amateur days, and she lost that fight by decision. She went pro in 2017. She's fought in Bellator, Ryzen, and of course Invicta. She's 2-0 in Bellator, 3-4 in Invicta, and 1-0 in, in Ryzen. Some of her prior fights, she fought Jessica Delboni, who's in the main event of this card. She lost to her by decision in 2021 and again in 2019. And when they fought, the big issue for Van Zandt was she couldn't get off the ground. When Delboni took her down, she had a very hard time getting back to her feet, and it was easy for Delboni to take her to the ground as well. She has a win over Rina Kabuda in 2019 via round one submission. They fought a rematch in 2019. She lost that fight because her corner threw the towel in for her. Kind of a weird ending. She fought Alicia Zapatella in 2020, lost that fight by split decision. And of course, Zapatella is in the main event of this card against Jessica Dobani. She gave a quality effort to that fight, and one judge thought she won. It was a split decision loss. It was maybe her best performance to date in Invicta. And she defeated Linda Mahalik last year, 2021, by decision. We'll bring up that name again in a second when we talk about the other fighter in this matchup. Two things I like about Lindsay Van Zandt. She's faced quality level opponents in her young career. She's a busy fighter, high volume. That's so important in women's fights. A lot of times women's fights go to the scorecards. The higher volume striker, even if they're landing less, just having more volume, more output, could get the edge in the scorecards in two of the three rounds. Now my concerns for Lindsay Van Zandt. She's on a rough stretch right now. She's four and four in her last eight fights, basically a 500 level fighter over the last two years. When she's up against better opponents, she does not push the pace enough. It's one of my biggest critiques of her. She needs to push the pace and set the tone. She needs to own that center of the cage. Again, women's MMA, 105-pound division, little things like posture, who has the middle of the cage, who's pushing tempo, who has more volume, those can end up being the determining factors on the scorecards. And with that in mind, when she's facing a better opponent who commands the center of the cage and pushes her back and forces her to circle, she's now throwing off of her back foot. She's not sitting down on her punches. And again, 105-pound division, I'm not expecting knockouts, but the point is if you're just tapping your opponent and you're backing up, you're not throwing anything really hard, nothing significant, it affects you again on the scorecards. Now looking at the fighter profile for Jillian DeCourcy, she's from Queens, New York. We mentioned before she trains at Long Island MMA. That's a very good gym. Several UFC fighters are out of that gym. She had an 8-1 amateur record, and of course she had the win over Lindsey Van Zandt by TKO when they fought as amateurs. They fought a handful of common opponents. For example, they've both lost to Alicia Zapatella by decision. They both finished Katie Perez for the win. Jillian DeCourcy has a win and a loss to Linda Mahalik. And we just mentioned before, Lindsey Van Zandt defeated Mahalik last year by decision. And lastly, they both lost via decision to Kelly D'Angelo. DeCourcy fought Alicia Zapatella in 2018, lost by decision. She fought Elise Reed in 2020, lost that fight by decision. Elise Reed is currently in the UFC with a 1-1 one -on -one record. And she fought Linda Mahalik. She fought her twice. Second time was 2021. Split decision loss, but it was only a first round fight. Just a one round fight, exhibition fight Invicta. Kind of a weird thing. She looked a little slow in that fight, and Mahalik is kind of a quick twitch fighter. She's very ripped, very athletic, but in that fight, it seemed to me like DeCourcy was a little bit slower, not keeping up with the, the quickness of, of Mahalik. Her head movement was not great either. At times, her head was just very still. She would get punched right through her guard at times, so she had her guard up, but somehow the punch was getting right through the middle. The jab was hitting her constantly. It's weird because a year before, they fought, and in that prior fight, which was a full three-round fight, Jillian DeCourcy won against Mahalik. Then they fight again in 2021 in a one-round fight, and Mahalik picks up the win in that fight. So, go figure. Some things I do like about the Corsi, she's a very active fighter. She fought once last year, twice in 2020, and four times in 2019. She's fought top-level competition. She's fought top-level fighters in Invicta, and of course she fought Elise Reed, who's currently in the UFC. She's very active on the ground and athletic. If she's down and she's on the bottom, she'll work, she'll shrimp out, she'll get back on top, she'll get back to her feet. And if she's on top position or has a good submission opportunity, she will attack submissions. Her first two amateur bouts, she won by armbar. 
and she has a few finishes throughout her career sprinkled by submission. Now, will she submit a very tough, durable Lindsay Van Zandt? Maybe not, but it is part of her arsenal, and then when she's in a tough spot on the ground, she can attack a submission just to reverse position or get back to her feet. Now, some of my concerns for Jillian DeCourcy. The biggest concern is she's 37 years old, 10 years older than her opponent. Now, she looks good for her age, but I mentioned that last fight against Mahalik. She looked slower, like she looked slower than she used to be for some reason. Is it because she's 37? It's a 105 pound division. You don't usually see 40 year old fighters, for example, in the 105 pound women's division doing very well. Now she's not 40 yet, but the point is she's closing in on that magic number. I believe athletically, she's at a bit of a disadvantage against the opponent here who's 10 years younger. She's also coming off of back-to-back -back losses, hasn't had her hand raised in a while. And lastly, her stand-up defense, as we mentioned before, is not great. Her guard is up, but it's not tight. You could punch her through that guard. Any opponents with decent boxing skills can get through that guard pretty simply. And even hooks around the guard, it seems like she doesn't pick those up. And lastly, she doesn't move her head. So if her guard is separate like this, and you're just jabbing her straight on the pipe, she's not moving her head. In a women's fight again, that's a big deal. No one's going to get knocked out here. Maybe a submission happens, but usually there's no knockouts in a 105-pound women's division. Every little detail counts. Who has the middle of the octagon? Who's forward pressure? Who's got more volume? And whoever's doing those things in this fight or doing two or three of those things or maybe getting a takedown here and there will win this fight. My final thoughts on these two fighters. Experience-wise, about the same. You've got seven total fights for Jillian. You've got 12 total fights for Lindsey Van Zandt. They've both fought similar competition. You can argue that Jillian's fought tougher competition. You can argue that Lindsey's fought better opponents. But to me, about equal. Strength of schedule is about the same. I think Lindsey Van Zandt is the better finisher. Neither one has an amazing finish rate. Again, 105-pound female division. So if a finish happens in this fight, I believe it's Lindsey Van Zandt by an armbar. They're both very durable. Again, 105 pounds. This fight most likely goes a distance. And lastly, I think Lindsey has the grappling advantage. If the fight gets to the ground, she's a little bit more athletic, a little quicker twitch muscles, and she's got submission ability. For Jillian DeCourcy, who likes to be on the ground and likes to wrestle herself, has to be careful because I think over the course of three rounds, Lindsey Van Zandt will get better position, have more top control, and look to go after more submissions than Jillian DeCourcy will. For DeCourcy, she can't stay on her back too long. She cannot stay in a guard. She's got to get off of her feet. If she's in a situation like that for too long, again, it's about optics, how the judges see this, who's on their back, who's landing more strikes, who's pushing the pace. Those will be the factors to determine who wins the fight on the scorecards. I'm going to estimate the money line opens up around minus 170 for Lindsey Van Zandt and about plus 125 to plus 130 for Jillian DeCourcy. It is a close fight. There's a lot of MMA math here you have to sift through. I believe at the end of the day, the 28-year-old, almost 10 years younger, that is going to be a significant difference. I think the volume is going to be a difference. Her athleticism is going to also be a separating factor. I'm going to get Lindsey Van Zandt to win this fight ever so slightly by a decision. Don't back the truck up on this fight here. It's women's MMA, very similar opponents. They fought each other before. Jillian's beat her before. There's also some good reasons to root for Jillian as well. I just believe right now is the time for Lindsey Van Zandt. She gets the win. And if you can get this at something around minus 200 or lower, so anywhere from like minus 150 to minus 200, there's good value there. I think we start creeping into minus 250 range. Now we're losing too much value. You don't want to have this in a parlay piece at minus 250 and it breaks apart your parlay. Now at minus 175, straight up bet, good value, or even as a parlay piece, I like it. If your books offer a prop for this, the fight going the distance, no question, that's a good prop to look at. Or the fight starting round two or round three. And then the long shot prop would be Lindsey Van Zandt by submission. That's the breakdown, guys. Thanks for joining us. If you have any ideas, maybe some props you like, give us some feedback, let us know. But we're on Lindsey Van Zandt to win the fight. Again, the money line should be around minus 175, minus 200 when it opens. Thanks for joining us again, guys. Please like and subscribe, and we're on to the next video. We're up to the co-main event for Invicta 47. It's going to be a featherweight bout between two American fighters. Courtney King, who goes by the Lion, versus Chelsea Chandler. Chandler's 3-1 overall. She hails out of Stockton, California. 5'8 in high with a 69-inch reach. She trains out of Caesar Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. As for Courtney King, who's 4-2 overall, she's out of Fort Collins, Colorado. 5'9 in high with a 69-inch reach. She trains out of Z's Training Gym. So height and reach, very similar. Only a 1-inch height advantage there for Courtney King, and they both have the same reach at 69 inches. As for the public votes and topology, Chandler is the big favorite, getting 84% of the votes, only 16% coming in for King. I have to disagree, guys. I think Chandler has a good shot to win the fight. I like Chandler. She's a good prospect. A lot of room to grow and a lot of improvements to make, but I think King gets the fight. She's got a little more experience. She's been in the octagon with Kayla Harrison. She survived almost two full rounds with that animal. Looking at the fighter profile for Courtney King. She was born in San Diego, California, though she's now based out of Colorado. She was 6-3 and three as an amateur. She went pro 2017. She's fought for LFA, Fury FC, and Invicta. She currently has a 1-2 record in Invicta. She fought Kayla Harrison two years ago, 2020. Round 2 TKO loss. That was her last fight. She came into that fight as a plus 1,045 underdog. My goodness. Harrison was 7-0 at the time with almost all of her wins in the PFL. So interesting enough, this was an Invicta match. I wonder if Invicta and PFL did a deal together. If you go back and watch the film, Kayla Harrison is wearing her PFL 
like jersey, her PFL shorts, her PFL shirt. Her corner's also wearing PFL t-shirts. That was the only fight Harrison fought in Invicta. All of her prior fights were in PFL. She's been in PFL since. So back to this fight. Courtney King gets mauled in round one. Surprised she even survived round one. She gets cut very badly, like a long, like four or five inch cut right in her forehead between her eyes. She's bleeding everywhere. Harrison's pummeling her on the ground. She survives that. Round two comes out. She survives almost the entire round two as well. It's not any prettier. There's blood everywhere. The referee eventually stops in with a few seconds to go in round two. And rightly so, it should have been stopped. She was just getting mauled and beat up. For Courtney King, her ground attack is actually pretty good against normal opponents. Against Kayla Harrison, she had nothing. She couldn't get back up. She was on her back the entire time, taking tons of damage, couldn't block, couldn't shrimp, couldn't do anything. We can't just over, we can't overreact just to this fight. That's Kayla Harrison, championship level Kayla Harrison. So of course, Courtney King did not look good in this matchup and she couldn't get back up. I do believe her ground game is decent. This fight didn't show that because she was against a championship level opponent. Prior fight, Holly Salazar, 2019, round two TKO win. She did solid work in this fight, came out with a different demeanor than the fight against Harrison, looked a little more confident, pushed the pace, was able to outwork the opponent. Holly Salazar, who's won one and one overall, not necessarily high level caliber competition. She also faded out towards the end of the fight. And when she faded out, Courtney King's cardio started to kick in and she started to take over the fight and take over the pace and pressure. And in this fight, you see Courtney King take the fight to the ground, own ground position, reverse on the ground, look for submissions, do all the things that she could not do against Kayla Harrison because, again, Kayla Harrison is a monster. And one more fight, her last fight before Harrison, 2019, round four submission win. She beat Audrey Wolf. Wolf is 4-1-1 one, and one overall. She last fought three years ago in Fury FC. Some things I like about Courtney King. In the fight against Kayla Harrison, I'd encourage you to watch it. She's getting her ass beat up. A lot of people would have tapped out and quit. She showed a ton of heart, a lot of durability, almost made it two full rounds. She did a good job in that fight. She showed she's got a lot of heart. She also throws a lot of volume, leg kicks, tons of combinations. And when she's on the ground, she's actually a pretty busy fighter, landing good strikes and also moving to better positions. She also has a pretty good finish rate. Three of her four wins have been my finish, two by sub and one by TKO. Granted, it's a small sample size, I understand, but yet she's still showing some ability to finish her fights. Some of my concerns for Courtney King. When she took a step up in competition against Kayla Harrison, she got mauled. It was not a good look. It showed clearly the difference in levels of this game, and she's nowhere near that level. If you remove Kayla Harrison from her tapology, and you can buy the records of the remaining opponents on her tapology, the record is 9-6-1 overall. Not the worst in the world, but still, she's fighting very inexperienced fighters so far, very low level winning percentages, and just hasn't been tested. And the one time she got tested against Kayla Harrison, we saw what happened. When she's in top position, she's busy. She's in control. Bottom position against a good grappler who's heavy on top against Kayla Harrison, complete nightmare. Do not take this the wrong way. She is not fat. I'm not saying that Courtney King is fat. I feel like she could lose a few pounds and probably fight down at a lower weight class. She looks to be like someone who could be a little bit leaner if she wanted to. The only problem with that is she's not a very fast fighter. She's not very quick as it is. So if she did lose weight and move down to lower weight class, then the speed deficiency would be even greater. So it makes sense she's at this weight class. But just looking at her physically, it seems like she could lose a few pounds and fight at a lighter weight class. She also may have some durability issues. Both of her professional losses are by TKO. And last but not least, we're going to coin that cliche term. She gives up position for submission. Ah, it's such a rookie move. She's done it before in past fights. She's been able to reverse and get back to the top position, but she cannot be giving up position for submission attempts. It's not a recipe for success. In a close fight, especially a women's bout, where position becomes deciding factor, control time, volume, who's got the better potty posture, who's bleeding or not bleeding. She's got to avoid those mistakes. She's got decent submission skills, but she's got to be better about not chasing a submission and giving up position. As for the profile of Chelsea Chandler, she was born in Stockton, California. She grew up playing basketball and running. She grew up as a competitive basketball player and a track athlete. She has no amateur record. She began her mixed martial arts training in 2011 in Thailand at the world-renowned Tiger Muay Thai. She joined the Nick Diaz Academy after graduating from college. She made her pro debut in 2018. She is 3-1 overall in Invicta. Her most notable opponents, her first pro fight, Kerry Kennison, 2018, decision loss. Kennison is 3-2 overall. She got out wrestled in that fight early on. She did a nice job reversing position at one point, getting back to top control, but then she chased a submission, submission over position type of thing, lost position because of the submission attempt. She looked very tired at one point in round one. I mean, very tired. After grappling on the ground for a little bit, trying to reverse position, she got up and she looked exhausted. She ends up getting dropped by a nice little left hook at the end of round one. It's a clear knockdown, but it was more because she was fatigued and just looking to just lay down. She was so fatigued in round two, she could barely fight back. The opponent was on top of her, taking ground control. She could not get up. She was barely even trying to get back up. She looked exhausted, taking deep breaths. And bottom line, she was not prepared for that fight. Her cardio was not in check for that fight. 
Now, granted, that was her first pro mixed martial arts fight. She drops that fight and then from there goes on a nice winning streak. She fought earlier this year against Olivia Parker, got a round one rear naked choke win, looked much better than that fight, much more dominant, took good position control on the ground, made good transitions, found her way into a good rear naked choke position and secured the rear naked choke. Parker's a decent opponent. She's four and three overall. She's also fought in Bellator and PFL along with Invicta. In a vacuum, those are two different fights. Kerry Kennison, her first fight, she gasses out, gets out grappled, gets out wrestled, loses the fight clearly. Four years later, 2022, against Olivia Parker, made some adjustments, looked a lot better. I would argue that Olivia Parker is a better fighter than Kerry Kennison. So you saw the improvement in her game. She made massive improvements over that four years. Some things I like about Chelsea Chandler, she's still very young. At 20 years old, she's still making big improvements, and I expect to see more improvements in this fight. And like her opponent, Courtney King, and like her opponent, Courtney King, she has some finishing ability. She's coming off back-to-back -back wins where she finished her opponent. Now, here's a positive and a negative. She throws with a lot of power, like the kind of power where she's off balance when she misses, the kind of power where you might get fatigued by throwing too hard. But if she connects against one of her opponents, it's going to be lethal. She throws with a ton of power. Again, she's got to be careful managing her cardio and not getting out of position. Now, some of my concerns for Chelsea Chandler. She's got very limited combat experience, only four total mixed martial arts fights, no amateur career, no Muay Thai background, no kickboxing background, and her cardio is still a question for me. In her last fight against Olivia Parker, she wins round one, so it looks good. But a few years ago against Carrie Kennison, she looked really bad at the end of round two and three. She looked very tired. It would be nice to see her go a full three rounds in this fight and check out from the cardio department. The cardio is also impacted by the way she fights. Big, powerful, high energy strikes. If you do that over the course of a round or two, it's gonna deplete your energy. You're gonna be out of position. Those big shots take a lot of energy. Wondering if she's gonna shore that part of her game up, be a little smarter about how she throws her punches. Don't throw so many power strikes. Save them for the right opportunity. Her stand-up defense is not the greatest, and it's partially because of the cardio. As she gets tired, her hands come down lower. Her head movement is non-existent. Now, even when she's fresh though in the beginning of fights, her hands are already pretty low. Her head movement's not great. She's there to be countered. She's got to shore up her stand-up defense. Either bring the guard up, improve your head movement, do not keep your head on a pedestal. It's been an issue in prior fights. Against a good striker, she's going to have some problems. Up to now, she's kind of fought some cans. Olivia Parker may be the best fighter she's faced thus far, but Courtney King will be her toughest test to date. And last but not least, she's coming off of a two-year layoff. At this age, we could see big improvements or we could see a lot of octagon rust. What has she been doing? Has she been working hard in the gym? Has she been making improvements? Was she thinking about retiring? The reality is at 20 years old, she should be a lot more active and shouldn't be taking two-year layoffs. My final thoughts on this fight. I'm going to give Courtney King the experience advantage and the strength of schedule advantage. Because she fought Kayla Harrison alone, that gives her a big bump up in experience and strength of schedule. Finishing ability, they both have it. I'm not saying they're both amazing finishers, but they've had some finishes recently. Could there be a finish here? Maybe. I think these guys are pretty evenly matched. If a finish happens, I believe it's Courtney King wearing down Chelsea Chandler. So imagining Chelsea Chandler just getting very tired and sort of tapping out from exhaustion or just balling up and not returning fire. They're both fairly durable fighters. I would say Courtney King has proven to take an ass whooping. She did it against Kayla Harrison. She was able to survive that. And in the case of Chelsea Chandler, even when she's been tired, she's shown to have a pretty good chin. So from a durability standpoint, I think both of these athletes check out. And lastly, who's the better grappler? Courtney King's the better grappler when she's in top control against an average opponent. Now, when she's against a better opponent like Kayla Harrison, she's terrible at grappling. For Chelsea Chandler, she's good at grappling when she's got the energy, when it's round one. When it's round two or three, not so sure. So hard to gauge who's the better grappler here. It depends on what point in the fight it is. It depends on what position they're in. I think overall, round one, probably neutral. I can see Chelsea getting some more top control. Round two and three, I see Courtney King taking over the ground control game and getting some more top position. Now, as for the money line, which we do not have yet, I'm going to estimate that the money line opens up around minus 250 for Courtney King and about plus 175 for Chelsea Chandler. I would be surprised if Chandler's the favorite. Now, according to Tapology, she's the public favorite, but Courtney King has fought the better opponents. She's had the better strength of schedule. She's a pretty experienced fighter. They're both the same age at 28 years old, so they're both very much in their prime years making improvements. I just think Courtney King will be the better fighter in round two or round three. You probably won't have any live betting opportunities for this fight unless your book offers that, but I can see Chelsea Chandler coming out in round one looking pretty good, getting top control, winning round one, and then round two and round three, the tide shifts a little bit, and then Courtney King takes over. Keep in mind, this is Invicta, so we'll get updates on the scoring between rounds. That's the breakdown, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe and give us some feedback. What do you think of this fight? Who do you like? Are there any angles that we're missing? Am I underrating Chelsea Chandler? All right, guys, we're on to the next video. Here we go. And we're up to the main event for Invicta FC 47. It's going to be a strawweight bout at 115 pounds between Emily Ducote, 
who's the defending champion, versus Alicia Zapatella. Zapatella goes by half pint. She's 9 and 3 overall, 4 1 her last five fights. She's fighting out of Michigan, 27 years old, 4 foot 11 in height with a 60 inch reach. She's out of Scorpion Fighting Systems. As for Emily Ducote, who goes by Gordina, and Gordina, by the way, I looked up the translation, it's like gordito, which means fat or chubby in Spanish, but it's also got translations in Portuguese and several languages, which means chubby. I'm not sure if she was chubby as a kid or it's some kind of like chubby cute thing. She's not chubby anymore. She's in great shape. In any event, Emily Dakota goes by Gordina. She's 10 and 6 overall, 4 1 her last five fights. She hails out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. 28 years old, 5 foot 2 in height with a 64 inch reach. She's out of American Top Team in Oklahoma City. An obvious thing to mention is the height and reach advantage. A 4 inch reach advantage for Emily Dakota and a roughly about 3 to 4 inch height advantage. That's typical for Alicia Zapatella. That's why she goes by the name Half Pint. She is very small, 4 foot 11 in height. She always has to reach this advantage and the height disadvantage in her matchups, and she does a great job of closing distance to make up for that. Looking at the votes coming in on Tapology, Dakota is getting most of the votes, 80% to be exact, only 20% coming in for Zapatella. I do agree. I think Dakota is a better fighter, better in this matchup, and has made big improvements over the last few years. Zapatella is a good overall fighter, and I'll tell you one thing. The judges seem to like her. They give her the benefit of the doubt in some close rounds, and she's won some split decisions, but the size disadvantage is a big one. It's hard for her to get into range. A lot of times she's boxing the air. Dakota's made some big improvements. Of course, with the fight's on the ground, that's Zapatella's wheelhouse, and that'll be her path to victory. But it's going to be hard for her to get Dakota down to the ground for all five of these rounds. Looking at the fighter profile for Emily Dakota first, she was born in Los Angeles, California. She wrestled in high school at Los Gatos High School. She finished runner-up at state championships her senior year. She currently resides in Oklahoma. She's a brown belt in BJJ. She had a 4-2 and two amateur record. She lost her pro debut in 2015 to Emily Whitmire. Now, Whitmire is 2-3 and three in the UFC. Not sure if she's still on the UFC roster, but she has some UFC experience. She studied Muay Thai and BJJ and also has a black belt in Taekwondo. She fights out of an orthodox boxing stance. She's, of course, the current Invicta Strawweight Champion. She's fought in Bellator, Invicta, and Extreme Fight Night. She had a 4-4 four four record in Bellator. Looking at some of her notable opponents, she fought Lima McFarlane twice. 2016, lost by decision. 2017, lost by an armbar in round 5. So it didn't get better the second time around. McFarlane is 11-2 overall, currently in the Bellator roster. In their first fight, 2016, she drops McFarlane with a beautiful uppercut in round 1. Clear knockdown, no question. Shortly thereafter, McFarlane gets a hold of her, brings her to the ground, and that becomes the theme of the rest of the fight. She cannot get off the ground, can't get off of her back, and spends pretty much two and a half rounds on her back, getting chewed up, not getting hurt, but McFarlane has position control. Now, 2017, they fight again. This time around, it's a similar event, except now in round five, Lima gets the submission finish. If you look at that fight in a vacuum, and you take it too seriously, you might think this fight's going to be a problem because Alicia Zapatella is a big-time wrestler. I do think Emily Dakota has made big improvements since then, but those are two rough fights for her where she got wrestled, out-grappled, out-positioned, and didn't have any answers there for Lima McFar McFarlane. She fought Janissa Miranda in 2019, earned a round one TKO win. She had a nice counter right hand, knocks down Miranda very clean, jumps on top of her, a few ground and pound strikes, and the fight is over. Maybe a premature stoppage there, but she definitely knocks down Miranda with a nice counter right hand. Her striking is very, very clean. We'll talk more about it, but her striking is right down the pipe. It was very clean, and she knocks Miranda off her feet. Two more fights to talk about. She fought Kanako Murata, 2019, split decision loss. Murata is currently 1-1 one one of the UFC. Decent level opponent, again, UFC caliber, and it went to split decision. So one judge does she won that fight. And then one more fight, her last fight, 2021, round one TKO win over Daniel Taylor. Taylor went 2-3 in the UFC, and she has a 2018 win over Montserrat Ruiz, who's also currently in the UFC. This is a fight worth watching because it's very short and sweet. It's a round one highlight KO. Dakota hits her with like a right-left combination and then follows up with a head kick. At that point, Taylor was already out of it. She's wobbling on her feet, about to go out, and then Emily cracks her with a head kick and just finishes the job. Nice highlight knockout. It was all over ESPN and the socials. The link is down below if you want to watch that prior fight. Nice quality win, and it gets a former UFC fighter and a fighter who's also got a win over a current UFC fighter. The things I like about Emily, a good finish rate. She's finished four of her last four wins, one by submission, two by TKO. She's fought a pretty good strength of schedule, several UFC level fighters and Bellator level fighters. She's got very sharp boxing. I love the way the punches are straight down the pipe and her hands come right back to her guard. She also takes her time early in fights. She doesn't push the pace too much, doesn't get overzealous, will take her time, evaluate her opponent, and then find the spots to execute. And lastly, she does a great job of working the body. She's not just headhunting, she's looking to get some body strikes, lower the hands, and mix it up. My two concerns for Emily. Number one, there's no kicking at all. No lower leg kicks, no body kicks, no head kicks. She does not kick. She's very one-dimensional with her striking. It's all done by her hands. Her grappling defense is average. She has some moments where she'll reverse position and look pretty good. But average is not going to cut it in this matchup. She will have to defend the takedowns from Alicia Zapatella. Zapatella has a way of making fights close. When it's close in a women's fight, position control will matter a lot. She cannot give up takedowns, and she cannot stay on her back for long periods of time. 
Now looking at the profile for Alicia Zapatella. She was born in Ohio. She began wrestling at the age of five years old. She played some other sports growing up, but she eventually dropped those sports to focus on wrestling. She was a two-time state champion in Ohio, five-time All-American, and 2016 Olympic Trials qualifier. She went 2-2-1 as an amateur. She went pro 2016. She's a purple belt in BJJ. Former Invicta FC Adam weight champion. She has a record of six and two in Invicta. Her prior opponents, she fought Jessica Dalboni twice. Last time was 2022. This year, decision loss. She came in as a plus 180 underdog. Her prior fight with Jessica Dalboni was last year, 2021. Split decision win. She was a minus 145 favorite in that fight. In that first fight against Delboni, it's my opinion, number one, she lost the fight. That's just my opinion. It came into the last round, tied up with the scorecards. You can see the judges' scores between the rounds. They show you that in Invicta. It's kind of nice, live scoring. It's tied going to the last round. She gets no takedowns in that round, which she needs takedowns to usually win fights. It's on the feet the entire time. It's very, very close. And two of the three judges give her the win, and they don't give it to Delboni. And I don't know what they were watching. I thought Delboni won that fight, clearly. She has a hard time closing distance in that fight. She spends a lot of time punching the air, missing strikes. As she gets tired, there's more looping strikes. Her legs are very short. Her arms are very short. So it's hard for her to reach an opponent as it is. Now you get an opponent who's much taller than her, much longer than her. It makes it even more difficult. I thought in that fight, her weaknesses were really glaring. And you could see the issues in that fight. I can't believe, again, the judges did not give that fight to Delboni. It's my opinion she did win. But this goes to what I said before. She seems to get the benefit of the doubt from the judges. There's something about her fighting style that they like. And one more fight to talk about. Lindsey Van Zandt, 2020 split decision win. She was a minus 150 favorite in that fight. She took Van Zandt to the ground immediately and kept her on the ground. Round two was very close though. Round two could have gone either way. Lindsey landed the better shots and striking is not really Zapatilla's forte. And each time this extended period of time in that fight on the feet, she was getting clearly outmatched. Now she got her position control a few times, got some takedowns. I thought Van Zandt had plenty of opportunities to improve her position on the ground and clearly win the fight she ends up letting it slip away it was a close fight and maybe van zandt didn't deserve to win that fight was very close and could have gone either way the things i like about alicia zapatella number one phenomenal wrestling comes from a wrestling background uses it in the octagon and she needs it to find a path to victory and secondly the judges seem to reward her she gets the benefit of the doubt for example i thought she clearly lost the first round of her fight versus cummings if you don't watch that first round the links down below she loses that first round the commentators also thought she lost the first round after round one they go to the scorecards, they give you the scores between rounds, and they show that one judge gave her round one. It's just bullshit. She didn't win round one of that fight. It was very clear. And you can hear the commentators saying, hmm, I'm, 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 not, I'm confused. When you've got three, four, five rounds to judge, it takes one judge to start screwing with things to mess it all up. If it's a close round, that's one thing. That was not a close round. She clearly lost round one of that fight, but for some reason, one of the judges gave her that round. I mentioned the Delbani fight. It's my opinion she lost the last round of that fight. That fight was tied going into the last round, yet two of the three judges gave her that round. When you look at that round, there's no takedowns. It's just striking, and there's no way Zapatella is beating Delbani on the feet with striking. Not today, not tomorrow, not any day. And yet for some reason, the judges gave her that round. There's a real clear reality with Zapatella. She needs to be on the ground to earn points in the scorecards. So back to that last round, how does she win the round against Delbani with no takedowns? Delbani stuffed all the takedowns. She landed the harder punches. She backed up Zapatella. How about just like ring real estate? The entire time Zapatella is circling Delbani, not engaging. Shooting for some takedowns, can't get him, kind of far away, can't close the distance because she's very short, never gets any takedowns, never gets a position control, and yet two of those three judges give that final round to her. I'm just putting it out there. In this fight, we might see Emily Dakota win the fight. We might visually see it happen. Judges may come in and say, listen, we like the way Zapatella fights. We just like it better. And they'll give her a few close rounds that'll determine who wins the fight. My concerns for Zapatella. She's got a very low finish rate. One finish in her last 12 fights. She's very undersized. Now she's accustomed to that. She's always a smaller fighter, but it's still a factor. When she does get top position, she does not do much damage in top position. She keeps position control. She'll grapple. She'll transition to different positions. But she's so stocky, if you can imagine this. Stocky, meaning short arms, short legs. For her to land an elbow, it's not really possible. She has like chicken wings. You know, it's, it's hard to get that flexibility to land that elbow or to land good strikes. She's so compact. That's just the way her physique is. So when she's on top position, she's not posturing up. She's not landing elbows. She's not doing much of anything on the top position. Now she's fishing for submissions, of course, but from the striking standpoint, she doesn't do much when she's on top position. And last but not least, she's the definition of one dimensional. If she cannot get the fight to the ground, if she gets stuffed in her takedown attempts, she will lose the fight. At least 
in the real world, unless some of the judges over here want to just give her the fight again. But the reality is, if she cannot get the fight to the ground and cannot get significant control position over her opponent, Emily Ducote, in this fight, she will lose. And I think that's going to be hard for her to do. Emily Ducote has made big improvements. She's taller. She's longer. She has good takedown defense. And I believe, look, there's going to be a point or two where Alicia gets maybe one takedown for some period of time. Emily just needs to make sure it's not for the greater part of three of the five rounds. My final thoughts on these two fighters. From an experience standpoint and strength of schedule, they're about the same. I give Emily Ducote a slight edge in the finishing department. We've talked about how she has three finishes in her last four wins, whereas Alicia Zapatella has one finish in her last 12 fights. They're both very durable, not easy to finish. And last but not least, who's the better grappler? Alicia Zapatella may be the better wrestler, but when it comes to actual grappling, reversing position on the ground, I've watched Emily Ducote do that. Alicia Zapatella cannot work from her back. She stays off her back. Prototypical wrestler, right? Stay off the back, never get on your back. For Emily Ducote, I've seen her from her back, reverse position, do some things. So in the event that Alicia Zapatella gets on her back for some reason, she'll be in a tough situation, whereas Emily Ducote has a little more skill there. So from a technical standpoint, I give Emily Ducote the edge in grappling. She's also got the better submission ability. She has submission finishes, whereas again, Alicia Zapatella has one finish in her last 12 mixed martial arts fights. That's the breakdown, guys, for the main event. I like Emily Ducote. I have some confidence. My only trepidation is, again, the scoring system. And if you guys don't recall, Invicta had an event. I think it was Invicta FC 45. Five, maybe maybe 46 it was one of the most recent ones where they had live scoring as usual and then between like rounds two and three they changed the scores and then between round three and four they changed the scores a motherfucking again and then between round four and five they changed it another motherfucking time i'm not exaggerating if you go back and look it up i think it was fc 45 or 46 they literally changed the scorecards three times throughout the fight what i mean by that is they had the scores in round one okay they post them after round one you got it they would go to round two and they would say, oh, the round one scores were actually different. We haven't flipped. This person won the round, the other person. And it's like, okay, one time, fine. It happened three total times in the broadcast. And I swore to myself after that fight, I said, you know what? I'm not taking Invicta FC serious anymore. I got off my soapbox. It's whatever. It happens. Look at what PFL had going on recently with their pre-recorded thing. I do like Invicta. I like women's MMA. It's an opportunity for a lot of female fighters to make their way into bigger promotions. They've got a history of having a lot of good fighters in this promotion. So I'm over it. But with that said, keep an eye out for really weird judging in this main event. I'm not going to be surprised at all if Zapatella starts getting some phantom rounds for no reason. It is a five-round fight. The scorecards have been a recent issue for Invicta. That's the breakdown, guys. I like Emily Dakota to win the fight. Let me know what you think. Do you like Alicia Zapatella? Am I underrating Alicia Zapatella? Will she be able to ground and pound Emily Dakota for five rounds? I don't think so. I think Emily Dakota is evolving, getting better, and this is her fight to win and for her to defend her title and still champion of Invicta FC. And that's the breakdown, boys and girls. I'm going to give you a quick review of our picks to win. Starting from the top, we like Emily Dakote, Courtney King, Lindsay Van Zant, Liana Prozen, Brittany Cloudy, Sydney Trio, and Alyssa Linduska. The fights we like the most that we have the most confidence in, Emily Dakote in the main event beating Alicia Zapatella, and Brittany Cloudy beating Serena De Jesus. Three fights that we have medium confidence in, Courtney King to win, Sydney Trio to win, and Alyssa Linduska to win. The two fights that we have the most questions about or the least confidence in would be Lindsey Van Zant and Liana Prison. And just a reminder, the money lines we talked about on this show were the estimated money lines. We don't have actual money lines yet. They have been broadcast. When they come out, hopefully ours are not too far off. So if you're not doing anything on Wednesday night around 8 p.m. Eastern, enjoy some Invicta FC 47. We'll have our bets available, as always, up for free on MMABet.tips. If you need a link to that profile, just look down below. And of course, we have the free video library, which is down below for you absolutely free where you're going to find abundance of links for prior fights and the fighters that we've talked about in this breakdown. As for parlays, we didn't talk about parlays or prop bets. I usually don't mess with prop bets when it comes to Invicta, but we will have some parlays available. Again, if you're not tracking us already on Twitter or on betman.tips, start tracking us. All of our betting information is up there. We track our stuff, win or lose, so we keep it 100 with you guys. Anyway, let me get out of here, guys. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you guys soon. Deuces. Facts again and again and again. Winning so much to be getting offended. I don't respond to be giving attention. I just leave that in the mentions. Oh, did I mention? I'm from a different dimension. I try and tell them that I ain't built different. You know I got different dimensions. Flow hypnotize them and give them dementia. Ooh, I'm needing more than one address. I want to buy some land right next to the sand. Cause I can't be pillin' my casket. Make sure I die with a tan. It's part of the brand. And they know I'm taking right off. from next to fly, and I do not plan on landing. I know that I came with a slide from left to right, but now I don't want to Dance, to see slide in the DMs, we started off on the right foot What a time to be alive, been seeing my future, my life good Couldn't duplicate what I'm doing, even if you took my rhyme book My mind took me all the way, straight line moving like my rook I'm playing chess and I do not check on my mates Cause I don't have time for no friends Can I depend on a man, I slide some bread in the jam That's just who I am I do not settle for crumbs, they wanted a piece of the pie to so keep your advance Custom just waving at us from the window, they don't even come on the plane when we
land, go at the plan. I never fold and I hold in my hand. Bubbling up like I open a can of the coke. Whoa, don't mind the mess. I got my wife helping manage my goals. I don't think twice when she handle my phone. I cannot spell out my favorite without even mentioning you. Canada knows. Loaded the beat and I dove in it deep. Flow bring the heat with the coldest demeanor. Sharp at the mic, I'ma overachieve. Bark with no bite, you a golden retriever. Ayy, get out the way as you going or not. Cause either way, I'm never going to stop. I kick in the door and I don't even knock. The verse like a halo, it's over the top.